Are you ready to pray? Yes. Let's yes. do it. Yes. Father, we thank you. We thank you. You are Lord of all. You are Lord above every struggle, difficulty, every problem we have. Thank you. Thank you, God. Lord, we thank you. Do we have these few moments this morning to gather up around your word? Lord, we pray that as, as your people have come hungry for what the Holy Spirit would say. Spirit of God, I pray that you would use my words today. I pray that you would help me to speak this message. And Lord, that you would help me to encourage and correct God. I pray that the spirit of this word would come forth to every heart. And Lord, we would be changed forever. God, we pray for those amongst us who are hurting this morning. Lord God, we lift up Harry Talbert to you. We pray that you give his body strength, give his lungs, his heart strength. God, have mercy upon our brother and help him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So Lord, we lift up north to you as he's recovering. We pray, God, that he recover quickly. And Lord, we pray you lessen his pain and help him to become mobile once again. Bless him as he recovers. And God, we pray for all of the things that are covered, Lord, all those hurts and all those pains and struggles that are covered this morning. You see them, we don't. But God, we just ask that you help and that you bless and that you deliver people out of the situations that they're in. And so God, as we look to you this morning, we thank you that you are the answer to every question we have. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You go ahead and take a seat. The first thing I want to say before we open up this message is that there is a kingdom that is coming. Amen. A kingdom is coming. A kingdom is here. A kingdom is within us. But there is a kingdom that is going to be revealed on the earth. It is coming. And it's going to be a kingdom that does not have any death, any sickness, any pain, Amen. any sorrow. Amen any rioting, any racism, any of the stuff and the junk that we experience today, there is a kingdom coming. Yes. And this should be something that just comes up out of our heart every single day we get up out of bed, that we are excited about this coming kingdom. Yes. And that our heart is crying out saying, come right now, Jesus, come right now. I'm ready for you to come and to set up this kingdom. And I'm ready to be done with the junk of this world. And so this morning, I want to preach a message to you that I've entitled, Arise and Shine. Arise and Shine. Now that phrase might be something that kind of catches your heart. Maybe you've heard that before, maybe when you were younger. But you know, you know that time may have happened to you this morning. That time that is kind of between awake and asleep. You know that time, right? It's between awake and asleep, and, and you kind of you kind of know you're starting to wake up, but you're still asleep, and, and you have this, this consciousness in your mind that it just could be any second that that alarm clock goes off, and then you drift back into a deeper sleep, and it seems like it's just one second's gone by, and all of a sudden, dun, 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 and then the alarm gets you up, and and you got to get up and get the day going. But when you were younger, a different thing would happen. It may be that your mom came into your room, threw open the curtains and said, Arise and shine. It's time to get up. And you said, Oh, Mom, you can't be morning already. And your mom says, Are you awake? And you said, Yes. And your mom said, Are you getting up? And you said, then you went right back to sleep, right? That's exactly what happens. Now, there's a crazy thing about being asleep. The crazy thing is that while you are asleep, you don't know what's going on around you. You have no idea what, go, what is going on around you. How many in this room, you would say, you know, I sure enjoy a good night's sleep, a good restful night's sleep. How many would say that? How many say you, you really enjoy that? Even if you're not raising your hand, I know you really enjoy that. <laughs> I, I'm about to ruin that for you in just a second, okay? Have you ever got on YouTube and, and saw videos 
of people that were sleeping in bed. And for some reason, they were filming them. I don't know if it was a sleep study or something was going on. They were filming them. And up over the corner of the bed falls the spy. You ever seen that? Have you ever seen those videos? Don't look them up. Don't look them up. You'll never sleep again if you ever look them up. Now, here's what statistics tell us. I think I told this before a few years ago. Statistics tell us that the average human being swallows eight spiders in their life. Do you believe that? Yeah. Do you ever wake up with something a little crunchy in your mouth? It just might have been that you had a little visitor early in the night. Now, I tell you all that to tell you this. The foundational truth of what we're studying this morning is this. That sleeping people are not aware of what is going on around them. So this morning we continue our series out of the book of Revelation. We have been looking at... At the seven churches, the, the, the seven letters, seven churches in the book of Revelation. And we have said this. We have said these messages that have come from Jesus. And John is writing them down in the Isle of Patmos. And he's going to send those out to those seven churches. Those letters are acts of love. Those letters are acts of mercy and kindness. Because what Jesus is doing is he is communicating with the churches, and instead of just letting them stay as they are, he is teaching and encouraging and even rebuking and correcting the churches so that they can be prepared, not only prepared to go through difficult times in the future, but also be prepared for that moment when they meet Jesus for the first time, when they become the bride of Jesus Christ. Jesus is preparing them in these letters to be that beautiful, bride adorned for her husband. And so these letters are a kindness to the churches. And so over the weeks, we have studied the letter to the church at Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira. And this morning, we're going to look at the church that is in the city of Sardis. And Sardis, uh, this is found in Revelation <coughs> chapter number so if you want to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter number 3, that's where we're going to be. Now, as we look at this message that Jesus is sending out to the church at Sardis, we find that it's a pretty short one. As a matter of fact, it's, it, it may be the shortest one, and it is only six verses. And if I could take this letter, take this message, and if I could kind of distill it and condense it down into just um, one sentence... This would be the message of Jesus to the church at Sardis. So you ready? Here's the message. Wake up or you're going to die. Now, aren't you glad I didn't make that the title of the, uh, of the sermon? Wake up or you're going to die. But that's what Jesus is saying to this church at the city of Sardis. And so Revelation chapter number three, beginning in verse number one. Listen to what it says. It says to the angel of the church in Sardis right. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have the <coughs> reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So what he says, I know your deeds, but you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Long ago, they had a good start. They were planted, they were thriving, they were a solid church, they had a good start. But now they are in a place of coasting, they're in a place of taking it easy. The church at Sardis was mostly dead. Not all dead, but mostly dead. As Billy Crystal said in The Princess Bride, there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. And Jesus was calling them to wake up before it's too late. Verse number two, that's exactly what he says. He says, wake up, strengthen what remains, and it's about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Why would they not know at what time? Because they're asleep. And sleeping people don't know what's going on around them. Verse number four. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. 
They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so like all of the cities that we've studied, all of the churches in the cities that we've studied, it helps to have a little bit of a historical context to be able to understand what Jesus is saying to this church. And of course, Jesus understood the history of the city. Jesus understood what was happening with these people. And so when he spoke to them, he was speaking, in that, speaking to them in that historical context. And so we need to understand that. The city of Sardis had really a great past. If, if you just look at it from a, from a natural perspective, they had a great past. And they were, they were a lot like some of these other cities. They had all their pagan temples. They had their uh, temple to the, to the Roman emperor. It was a city that was at the junction of five main roads. And so because of where it was located, it became a center for trade. It was known for manufacturing woolen products, but it had really two unique things about it and about its history that really stand out to me as I look at this city. The first one is this. It was a fortified city. It was built on the side of a mountain. The, the entrance to Sardis was 1,500 feet below the road, the main road. The city was protected by a triple wall, not a single wall, not a double wall, but a triple series of walls. There was also a river that ran in front of the city that served as a moat. And so this city felt very, very, very safe from external threats. And so that's one thing that was very unique about this city. A second thing that was unique was it had a very famous king in its history. Long before Rome was an empire, there was a guy by the name of King Croesus, and he ruled the area. He was referred to as kind of a, a Midas type guy. You ever heard of Midas, you know? The guy that everything he touched turned to gold. And that's what Croesus was like. He, he was this guy that had a lot of wisdom, a lot of ingenuity, and he really created a lot of wealth there in the city of Sardis. He, under his leadership, they found out that running through that river that served as a moat in front of the city, there was gold in there, and they were able to take the gold out, and it was at this city that they first had been able to mint coins, gold coins. And so the wealth of the city began to increase, the luxury of the city began to increase. It became known far and wide for its luxury, for its, its safety, its security, and its wealth. But the walls and the wealth had a strange effect upon this city of Sardis. Because of their safety and wealth, they became soft. They became overconfident. They feared nothing. They got sleepy, and they let their guard down. As a matter of fact, for as fortified and strong as this city is, the crazy thing about it is they kept getting defeated over and over again over the years. And one story is told about King Cyrus. King Cyrus came against uh, the city of Sardis, and he, he set up his troops out there, and they saw this triple wall, and they said, how, how am I going to get past this triple wall? And so he offered to all of his soldiers, if you can figure out a way to get past this wall, I'm going to give you some kind of reward. And so they all set about trying to figure out how to get past this triple wall. Well, one night, one of the soldiers was looking up at the wall, and on the wall there were watchtowers, and there were sentries, watchmen in these watchtowers. And as he watched this one watchman up there, the watchman got the nods. Do you ever get the nods? It's really scary to get the nods while you're driving. That ever happened to you where you're driving along and all of a sudden <clears throat> you're not up? Like well, the watchman, not at all, his helmet fell over the wall. And so as this soldier of Cyrus is watching this whole thing, the guy's falling asleep, his helmet's falling off, in front of the wall, falling down in the, in, in the dirt. He watches, and lo and behold, 
coming out of the side of the wall is this watchman. He had come down. He knew of this secret entrance into the into the city. And so he came down, got his helmet, put his helmet back on, went back into the wall, went back up. Guess what happened that night? The city fell because the watchman fell asleep, dropped his helmet, and he was the one that gave way how the city could be destroyed. By the time John was writing his letter, and these letters went out to the churches, Sardis had greatly declined as a city, but it still had that sleepy, lazy kind of attitude about it. And I believe this, that the point of Jesus' letter to the church at Sardis was that the church had become like a city. Instead of the church changing the city, the city changed the church. Yeah. Let me say that again. Instead of the church in Sardis changing the city of Sardis, the city of Sardis changed the church in Sardis. Still happens today. The spirit of Sardis is still alive today. Churches do surveys of their communities. They go out door to door and they say, Dear citizen, we'd like to take a survey. We want to know what it would take for you to come to our church. And so they take their notepad and they're, they're listening for what the person is going to say. This is what it would take for me to visit your church and come to your church. They say, well, listen, I don't like it when you talk about sin. So do not talk about sin. And, and, and don't talk. What I want you to talk about in your sermon, Pastor, is I want you to talk about how to be successful and how God loves me and, and his total goal in all the universe is my happiness. I want to hear more about that. And also, I don't want you to talk anything about money. And softer chairs would be cool. Uh, shorter services, colder air conditioning, and really good coffee. If you could provide that, maybe I would think about coming to your church. Look what Jesus says. It seems to me that the language in this letter is pointing out to us and pointing out to Sardis. That the problem that the church in Sardis had was they were becoming more attached to the world than they were anticipating the return of Jesus Christ. They were becoming much more interested in the culture and participating in the culture in Sardis than they were thinking about and hoping for the return of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3, 2, listen to it again. Jesus says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Listen, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. They, they started to do the job. They started with their eyes anticipating and loving the return of Jesus Christ and, and putting forth the kingdom of God. But they got sleepy and, and somewhere along the way they just sat down and they began to take a nap. They started out building the kingdom, but then at some point they said, you know, this Sardis is a pretty nice place to live. Let's just take it easy for a while. Verse number three again, it says, but if you do not wake up, I will come to you like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Again, they quit longing for the return of Christ, and because they had fallen asleep, they wouldn't even know what was happening around them. <laughs> Revelation 3, 4, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. And as we read this, as a matter of fact, a lot of the language in this letter is return of Jesus language. It's a language that, that we see in other parts of the scripture that focuses on a thinking about and a longing for and a being ready for the return of Jesus Christ. And as we look at these white clothing, these white robes, we see this in scripture as wedding garments, preparation, ready for the return of Jesus. You know, when we get dressed to go somewhere that is special, we put on our nice clothes, we put on something that's clean, we 
be put on something that, that we would like to be seen in in public. And in those clothes, we're very careful that we don't get them dirty because we're going somewhere special. And we're going to be around some people that we care about and are important in our lives. And so we're very careful about what we get our clothes. But on the other hand, if we don't care much about those people, if we're really not sure we're going anyway, you know, we might decide, well, let's just go over to the Dairy Queen and get ourselves a chocolate cone on a hot summer's day. And just let that chocolate drip down onto our shirt because it really doesn't matter because we're not really going anywhere anyway. And so we can also look at it like this. We can say a little bit of sin might leave a stain, but you know, Jesus isn't coming soon anyway. And so we go to sleep. And that's exactly what the church at Sardis did. And that's exactly what they said. We're not too concerned about the return of Jesus right now. We're just kind of enjoying the city of Sardis. Let's lay by the pool. We'll take a little nap. We've got some money. We've got these big walls. We've got a name. We've got a nice city to live in. Ain't life great? My next point is kind of really obvious, isn't it? It's the question. Does Sardis remind you of any other place you know of? It kind of reminds us of America, doesn't it? America says, we have money, we're doing okay. America says, we are the greatest superpower, greatest military in the world, nobody can touch us. But unfortunately, what happened in Sardis has also happened in America. Instead of the church in America changing America, America has changed much of the church. Instead of longing for the return of Jesus Christ, the church in America is living pretty comfortably, doing okay. As a matter of fact, there are a whole lot of Christians, instead of saying, oh, I just want, if Jesus would return today, I'd be so happy. Instead of that, they're really saying, you know, Jesus, if you can like push this off like 20, 30 years, there's some things I want to do. I'm not quite ready to see you yet. I'm not quite ready for heaven yet. I've got some plans here I've got to take care of on the earth. The church has been given the job of proclaiming the, com the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church has been given the job of proclaiming the gospel that Jesus loved us so much that he was nailed to a cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And the church has been given the job to be salt and light in the world, to advance the cause of the kingdom of light and to repel the kingdom of darkness. Can you say amen? Amen. Last night, I saw the kingdom of God. I turned off Facebook and I was going down through Facebook and I saw a live feed. Actually, I saw two kingdoms. I saw the kingdom of light and I saw the kingdom of darkness. When I turned on that Facebook feed, it caught my eye because it was a live feed coming in from Portland, Oregon. And my daughter Jessie right now is in Portland, Oregon. And so it kind of caught my eye. I said, well, what is happening here? Well, what is happening is there was a park that was right by the river that runs through downtown Portland, Oregon, very close to where all of the riots are taking place. What is, what is it, like over 70 days now that riots have been taking place in Portland, Oregon? As you looked at what was happening here, there was a, there was a worship service going on. This worship service was just praising God, awesome praise and worship. The news reported that there were a couple hundred people there. You get on Facebook and you find that thing. I would say there was like maybe four or 5,000 people there in that park. It was awesome. And it was awesome. Not only was the praise and worship great, but also the preaching. The guy came out and began to preach, and he preached a solid gospel. He preached about Christ. He preached about the cross. He preached about Jesus shed blood. He preached about sin, and he called the people there to repentance 
and to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And many of them did. And being right by the river, they went down to the river and many of them were baptized. You also saw in this video, I said to Jennifer, I said, did you see that? We watched this thing for two hours last night. I said, did you see that? Because as they took this phone, there was on a phone, Facebook Live thing going on, and the, and the music was going on, the preaching was going on, and they would show the people back as far as you can see to the edge of the park, all raising their hands and worshiping God. It was just an awesome sight. And over on the side, there were people standing with a sign. And the sign says, we rebuke your white supremacist Jesus. That night, Christ was lifted up. The kingdom of God came to earth. But not very far from there, they were setting the police building on fire. And rioting once again. And we see this comparison between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Church tonight, this same group that put on this event that these thousands of people came to and many, many gave their life to Jesus, they're going to be in Seattle. And they're going to be holding a worship service right in the, the Chaz area where that, where that used to be held by, by the rioters. And so we need to stop right now and pray for them. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for these that are going right into the enemy's territory. God, we pray that you would fill them with the Holy Spirit. Lord, as they, as they lead praise and worship, as they preach the gospel, Lord, we pray that many, many people would come. We pray that people would be set free, God. We pray that people, that miracles would happen, that healings would happen. God, we pray that even some of those that, that plan to do some rioting tonight, instead they come into the kingdom of God. Lord, we pray that as they go from city to city to city, they're going to the cities where the riots are. God, bless them and help them. Help them speak the truth. Holy Spirit, pour out your power upon them. And Lord, we pray revival would come all across this land. That the kingdom of light would defeat the kingdom of darkness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The church has been given the responsibility to stand up, proclaim the coming kingdom, proclaim the gospel of Christ, and be salt and light in the world. But listen, i got to tell you something, and you know this. That many churches across this land, although they have been given this sacred duty to be awake, to be alive, to proclaim truth, they're asleep. In many parts of this country, the church is napping. And I think Jesus wants us to stop and say, what has happened while the church is napping? So we can take inventory on what needs to be taken back. Can you say amen? amen. So while much of the church has been napping, what has happened? Number one, the church let the government define what was true. Many, many churches, and, and I have preached from this from this pulpit, and this be true, that the Bible calls you and me to submit to the governing authorities. Romans 13, 1, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Everybody say amen. amen. But what we have made the mistake with is we have misunderstood that the authority that God gives the state, gives the government, is to establish order and to keep the peace. Amen. God never gave the government the authority to define truth. Amen. But the church somehow has handed over the keys and not only has said we will submit to the authorities as they order truth in our society, but the church somehow has said, why don't you go ahead and define truth? Why don't you go ahead and define right and wrong as well? We've quoted Romans 13, but forgot Romans 1. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, 
His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore, listen to what happened now. Mankind has said we are we're not going to honor God. We're going to honor man and idols and everything else but God. Verse 24 says, Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. For the degrading of their bodies with one another, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless faithless, heartless, ruthless. And although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And so, the church handed over the keys to define what was true and moral and good our government then redefined marriage. Our government has redefined sexual sin as a human right. Our government has told the church that you may not speak about political things and political candidates. Our government has told us that churches spread the virus, but rioters do not. It's time for the church to wake up and tell the government to shut up. Amen. Amen. We've let the government take authority over our churches, our children, and it is time to take that authority back. While the church has napped, we've given over the authority of determining what is true to the government. We've got to think of that. The second thing, while the church was sleeping, we let the news networks tell us what was happening in the world. Reporting used to be telling us what was going on, but now reporting is telling us what to think about what we're being told is going on. For a long time, we've known that, the, that most of the network news uh, channels are propaganda, and most of what is coming across is lies. But I've been very disturbed and I've been very discouraged almost to find my beloved Fox News is falling into that same pattern. There's been so many times that I've been watching a program and I, I, I said, I, I, I must not have heard that right. Let's run that back. I, and lo and behold, there is a shift that is taking place at Fox News. There's, there's still a handful of people I think that you can trust but the network itself is beginning to shift. But you know what? That's okay, you know why? Because for a long time, the church has been listening to Fox News rather than the Holy Spirit. And we are in a day now 
where it has never been so important that we know what the voice of the Holy Spirit sounds like. Can you say amen? amen? Because we are fast approaching the day where you can trust no one. As a matter of fact, we're probably there. And we have got to be a people that hear God ourselves personally, that the Spirit of God would tell us what we need to know, and we wouldn't sit in front of a television asking somebody to tell us how we should think. The third thing while the church has been napping, we allow celebrity preachers to come in with large churches and TV shows and to tell us what to think about Scripture. Great speakers, great storytellers, awesome music. But the church has been so asleep that the church hasn't opened up the scripture to understand the truth for herself. And so she's being fed twisted scriptures and doesn't even know the difference. The church is called to be salt and light. But these false teachers are entertainment. They're entertainment for the sole purpose of an offering. And we need to know the difference. First Timothy 4 and 3, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to this. It's time for the church to wake up. The fourth thing that I want to point out to you is that while the church was napping, the world has redefined the family. There's always a struggle about saying certain things from the pulpit. Because one side will say you can't say certain things because there might be people sitting in the sanctuary that this would really offend them, this would really bother them, because this is really personal to their experience. And so you've got to be more sensitive to that. But then there's the other side. If the church doesn't say something about certain things, then the folks growing up in the church, and especially young people in the church, they think it's all okay. Because nobody said it isn't. And all they're watching is society, and society is saying this is all great stuff, and if the church is not saying anything about it, well, the church must think it's great stuff too. And so our kids growing up in church, they just think it's all okay. And so we have to be able to say certain things. And so while the church has been napping, the world has redefined what the family is. The world has said sex before marriage is great. Living together, having sex, not being married, great. Having kids in that context, great. We love everybody, and there are people that have made those mistakes, and they've come out of that, and they're following Christ, and praise God for that. But we've got to say very, very firmly and very, very clearly, that is not God's way. God's way is a marriage covenant, a sacred covenant between a man and a woman. If you have that experience and you've come through that and you're following Jesus, praise God. But if you're in the middle of that right now, I don't say this to condemn you. I say this to call you upward, to call you upward and to say this is not God's way. The family is mother, father, children. A foundational structure in our society for strength and training up children and love and, and, and contentment and security emotionally, psychologically, physically. The world has said, no, 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 we can't, we can't have that picture of a family. That offends us. That threatens us. Because people who aren't living like that, they're going to feel bad about that if you say that that's that's God's picture of a family. And of course, if you have a homosexual couple and they adopt a child, and you say, wait a minute, that is, that is not God's way either. That, and, and that is offensive. That's politically incorrect. And so these forces in society are saying, now the nuclear family, mother, father, children, this is not only not necessarily normal, it's bad, it's even evil. And it has to be done away with. And while the church has been napping, We've just handed over that definition of what the family is to somebody else. Of course, while the church has been napping, the world has redefined Jesus and salvation. We've talked about this many times. 
The world says salvation is not only through Christ, it's through all the great religions of the world. The Bible says it is only through Jesus. Salvation is only through Jesus. The world says, no, 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 you don't understand. Jesus, we have a deep understanding of Jesus. See, Jesus was all about love. And so love means you let me do whatever I want. You pat me on the back and you embrace me because whatever sinful lifestyle I choose, if you're going to love me, you have to say it's the greatest thing you've ever seen. And that is just not true. But the church has allowed the world in many places to redefine our lives. Number six, while we were sleeping, we let the world redefine origins. What do I mean by that? We let the world say that God did not create the world and mankind. We can't, the world can't say that because if the world says God created the world, the universe, God created Adam and Eve, God created every single person, well, then every single person, the whole world, the whole universe would all be accountable to him because he owns it, because he made it. And so the world says, no, 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 we've got to redefine this. God did not create these things. This was all evolution. It was by chance. It was an accident. In steps Charles Darwin and so-called science to teach us that God did not create the world. That Genesis is really just kind of a story. It, it didn't really happen like that. It's just kind of a story. But see, if Genesis didn't happen, if Genesis isn't true, if we can't trust the creation account in Genesis, how can we trust any other part of the Bible, including the part that says the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ? And so this teaching, Darwinism, evolution goes out into all the world. God didn't create the world. It was an accident. And so generations of our kids, they go off to college. They come from Christian homes. Four years later, they graduate, and now they're enlightened agnostics. They know there's something out there, but it sure isn't that God of the Bible that their parents had taught them and the church had taught them. They've been taught the Bible is just a bunch of stories. And then on top of all of that, the university send us massive bills to pay for the destruction of our children's hearts and minds. And the church is found snoring in the corner while all this is going on. But I got a question. Here's my question. For all those that believe in Darwinism and all those that believe in evolution, man came from some organism rather than the creative power of God. I've got a question. Why aren't the statues of Darwin being torn down? <clears throat> Darwin was the ultimate racist. He believed the black man was not as evolved as the white man. We know his most famous work as The Origin of the Species, but I don't know if you've ever heard the full title. It's a long title, so I understand why they don't use it, but, but it's very eye-opening. Here's the title of Darwin's work. It's, the title is All the Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races. The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for life. Who do you think the favored races are? White men. In another book, The Descent of Man, Darwin says the white man is more advanced, and he refers to blacks and others as lower organisms and even savages and degraded. So while the church sleeps, the world has made a racist. A hero. And why are they content with Darwin? <coughs> because Darwin removed the Bible and redefined God so that mankind can be free of accountability in the world. 
While we slept, we handed the keys over to the government, the news networks, the false teachers, and Charles Darwin. But it's time to wake up and to take those keys back. Can you say amen? Amen. Yeah. Remember what I said to you at the beginning of this, that when you're asleep, you don't know what is going on around you? Here's another truth. When you're asleep, you don't know you're asleep. Not only do you not know what's going on around you, whether it's the spider crawling on your pillow or whatever it is, but you also don't know you are asleep. Unless you're waking up, if you're in a deep sleep, you never think to yourself, I wonder if I'm asleep. Because here's another mind-twisting, mind-boggling truth. If, if I think to myself, I wonder if I'm asleep, I'm not asleep. Can you say that? Here's the same truth applied to Christians. If you ask a Christian, are you awake? They'll all say yes. Because if they're asleep, they don't know. Because they're asleep. And so the question as we can get ready to end this is simply this. How do we know we're awake? Because we'll tell everybody we're awake. And we'll say to ourselves, I'm awake. But how do I really know if I'm awake? First of all, when we looked at Sardis, Sardis stopped longing for the return of Jesus. The church in Sardis got comfortable and stopped longing for the return of Jesus. If you are awake in Christ, you want Jesus to return right now. And you're ready right now. You'd be okay with it right now. You'd be okay to be done with this world. Now, on the other hand, if you're in that place where you're like, I don't think so, maybe give me 50 years, i got to tell you something right to your face. You are asleep. You're asleep. I love you, but you're asleep. Because if you're awake, your heart, your spirit is saying, come, Lord Jesus. Return. Maranatha. Come right now. A second thing, a second thing, you'll know you're awake if you love his word and his presence. You'll know, you know you're awake if you can pick up the Bible and begin to read that word and it just speaks to your heart. There's just something about it, man, it just, and you may not even fully understand what you're reading, but there's just something about it that nurtures your heart. It's just Food to your soul. And when you bow your head to pray, you sense his presence. And when you come into a place like this and worship, as the songs begin to sing and as the music begins to play, you, you feel your heart, you feel your spirit being lifted up. You feel the presence of God. If you don't feel those things, you may be a slave. If you don't feel those things, if you don't have a love for God's word, if you don't have a love to feel his presence, if you don't have a love to come and worship and lift your heart and your voice up to God, you might want to stop and take some inventory because you just might be a slave. Sardis started. Here's another way we can, we can understand whether or not we're awake. Sardis started the work there in the city. The, the church in Sardis started the work in the city. And then they got sleepy and they took a nap. Now, many Christians, they start well. You remember, you remember your early days, right? You remember your days where all of a sudden Jesus has become real. Your eyes are open. Your heart is soft. You know he's forgiven your sins. And it's just it just fills your thoughts. You read his word and it's just like, oh, man. This is just the best thing ever. The trees look different, you know. Outside smells different. Food smells different, you know. And you're seeing everything through a different pair of glasses. You remember that time, right? And a lot of Christians, what will happen is they'll have that experience where they completely come alive. And time goes by and time goes on. And all of a sudden they come to the point and they say, I, I don't nearly have the interest I had in you. What happened? What happened is you fell asleep. You got sleepy along the way, and you began to nap. 
If you can look back at a time when you were excited about Jesus, but you're no longer excited about Jesus, you're no longer excited about his return, you're no longer excited about his word, you're asleep. And last, there was once a time when your choices reflected a desire to be unstained by the world. But you can look now, as time has gone on, you can see that your standards have been greatly relaxed. You don't care nearly as much about keeping that garment unstained and being ready to meet Christ. If your standards have been incredibly lowered over the years, you're probably asleep. Now this morning, church, if you've come to the conclusion that like the church in Sardis, you're asleep, or mostly asleep, then Jesus tells us what to do. He says, remember therefore what you have received and heard. And he just simply says, obey it and repent. In other words, remember those early days and do whatever it takes to get back there. This church, there is a kingdom that is coming. There's a kingdom coming. It is on the horizon moving towards us. You don't want to be asleep when that kingdom comes. Amen? Let's stand together. Worship.